Chapter 1. Sowing and Reaping. A Quick Harvest on the Third Day. Fear spreads like cancer on nearly every continent. Terrorists paralyze and destroy entire populations. Governments dissolve into genocidal wars. Thousands die in horrific natural disasters. Medical science floods the world daily with hundreds of breakthrough drugs and treatments, while vaccine shortages and new strains of disease threaten the health of millions. The staggering pace of modern society bombards us in every newscast, from deep divisions over morality issues to technological advancements. What does this plethora of change mean? Is there a reason or some explanation for the chaos around us? Yes. Everything that happens throughout our society and the world is foretold within the covers of the Bible. We live at a unique juncture in history, the period just prior to the glorious return of Jesus Christ. As the world rushes toward the abyss, we are about to see the revelation and release of the mature sons and daughters of God foretold in the Word of God. See Romans 8, 19. The Word of God reveals a clear picture of the church and its transformation in these last days. We, as a generation, are about to see the Lord's vision of the church manifested in this final hour. This is that time the moment in history that is both prophetic by nature and astounding by implication. The glorious church, the spotless bride of Christ, arises now, and we can be a part of it. This hour holds the revelation of all that the Holy Spirit chooses to release to us if we have ears to hear and eyes to see. A number of years ago, the Lord began to challenge me regarding the third day as written in Scripture. It was new territory for me, and it tested some of my most cherished traditional thinking. I am astonished at the ability we have as people to cling to mindsets that are currently popular yet very contrary to the Word of God. The first place Holy Spirit led me to was 2 Peter 3, 8. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. This is the foundational scripture upon which the promise of the third day is based. From this inauspicious starting point, I embarked upon a journey of discovery that was both breathtaking and awe-inspiring in its scope. The Word of God has an incredible amount to say about the third day, and revelation pours forth to an overwhelming degree if we are willing to hear. Before we begin, we must understand something about numbers in Scripture. They are supernatural in design and spiritual in significance. There is much revelation to be gleaned from the understanding of biblical numerology. The number three is the number of the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It speaks of maturity and resurrection. It is the third day. When we see the number seven in the Bible, it is a prophetic picture and revelation of God's finished, perfect work. It speaks of completion and covenant promise fulfilled. Think about the way Peter emphasized the one thing he didn't want the believers to forget. Don't forget this one thing. This is a powerful and sobering statement. Suppose Jesus himself walked into the room right now and said to you, I have just one thing I want you to remember above all else. You would know that there was weight and importance attached to that statement, wouldn't you? When Peter says, With the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day, it is my opinion that this scripture was more for this generation than any other generation that preceded us. This is the end of the age. From the time of Adam until approximately October 1999, we have completed six days, and we've entered into the seventh day, more than 6,000 years, and moving into the 7,000th year. 
we have to understand from the outset that the seventh day is a day of completion, a day of rest, a day of covenant promises being fulfilled, and a day when the Lord will bring to conclusion all he began in the Garden of Eden. It is a day when the Lord spoke and said, It is finished. This is the seventh day, and the Lord is about to bring a magnificent, miraculous conclusion to everything he began. God has bestowed honor upon us in that we are alive and present at the conclusion of history. We cannot begin to comprehend how blessed we are. Picture it. In the strategy room of heaven, before he laid the foundation of the world, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit chose you and I to participate in the greatest event in the history of the world, the final harvest and return of Christ. The idea is overwhelming. The honor is incalculable. What an awesome God we serve! If the President of the United States invited you to the White House to dine with him and the First Lady, you would feel honored, and rightly so. The one I am referring to is the King of the Universe. And he says, I want you, my chosen people, to see me in my finest hour when I bring to conclusion every word and fulfill every vision and I want you to be there to see it and participate in it. This is the hour in which we live. There is another significant number revealed at this time. From Jesus' birth to approximately October 1999, we have completed the second day, and we are now early in the morning of the third day, more than 2,000 years, and moving into the 3,000th year. These two days relate prophetically to the day in which we live. They reveal a specific design and purpose of the Savior. As we continue to delve into this prophetic picture, we will see more clearly the profound implications of what it means to live on planet Earth as these prophetic days unfold before us. The Third Day The third day is the day of resurrection and it signifies a release of resurrection power in this hour. That is why we have been hearing and will continue to hear more and more testimonies about people being raised from the dead. It's the day of resurrection. This is a profound prophetic picture and witness of the hour in which we live. Jesus was our forerunner, not only literally, but in type also. There are more people being raised from the dead in this hour than any other time in history. An American missionary in Mexico has seen in his ministry alone close to 200 people raised from the dead. The Word clearly states that Jesus is also Lord of the Sabbath. See Luke 6, 5. The Sabbath is the seventh day. While we know that Jesus is Lord of all, there is a special impetus and weight to Jesus' statement of being Lord of the Sabbath, the 77th day in which we live. His Lordship will be demonstrated and displayed to an extent and to a degree the world has never seen. And it will be displayed in and through the body of Christ. As we study the Word of God, we find that divine covenants appear to be established at 2,000-year intervals. You will find that the Abrahamic Covenant was established approximately 2,000 years after the fall of Adam and Eve. The blood of Christ instituted the New Covenant, or New Testament, approximately 2,000 years after the Covenant of Abraham. Right now we stand 2,000 years from that New Covenant. Clearly, we are on the threshold of the most wondrous move of God the world has ever seen. Many spiritual Jews have long divided the six-day work week God gave Adam like this, using 1,000 years as a day. Two days of chaos. Two days of the law. Two days of Messiah. Then would come the seventh day of rest. They correctly saw that the Messiah would come after four days, after 4,000 years. 
they believed that he did not come because they were not ready. The two days of his rule, being the last of the three periods, were called the last days. When Jesus came 2,000 years ago, it was the beginning of the last days. We live at the end of the last days. Ancient rabbinical history indicates that Jewish rabbis understood Adam had only been given a six-day lease on the earth. It was irrelevant that he allowed Satan to wrest control of this earth from him. The lease was still only six days. It was foretold by rabbis that on the seventh day the Lord would reclaim the earth and all that he created. He will not wait until the end of the seventh day to do so, as we will discover. This promise of the third day is revealed as we journey through Scripture. Every verse we examine has a corresponding ministry application as well as a personal application and fulfillment associated with the work of the Holy Spirit in us and through us. The Lord taught me a long time ago that what He chooses to release through us must first be formed in us. The truth about the third day must be received by faith and by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Once the revelation is formed in us, we will begin to walk in these promises and the Lord will be glorified through us. We must walk in these promises. We must work out our sanctification. We must come to the place where the character of Christ is exemplified in our lives rather than the worthless works of our flesh. The church has been inundated for generations with fleshly carnal character that portrays a less than truthful picture of Christ. This is the hour when the Lord will return for a church without spot or wrinkle, a mature, spotless church. What an honor, and what a sobering thought. Separation of the Body for Change The first third-day scripture is found in Genesis 1, 9-13. Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, so the evening and the morning were the third day. Our God is a creative God. The only thing in this universe, the only thing in all of creation that does not change, is God. Everything else is in a constant state of flux and change. You and I were created for conflict and change. Your physical body must constantly challenge itself. From muscles to mental faculties, without continual stimuli and challenge, you will atrophy and wither away to nothing. You and I were created for change and conflict. Nature itself proves this. None of us were created to be couch potatoes or pew warmers. There is no such thing as spectator Christianity. Rather, I should say, spectatorship was never God's plan for his people. Our traditions and our fears have created vicarious involvement rather than proactive participation. None of us are called to be spectators in the end of the age. The watchmen on the wall, the intercessors, are not to be spectators. They are the gatekeepers who must man their post and sound the alarm as God gives them command. You will notice in Genesis 1-9 that the waters were gathered together in one place and the dry land appeared. There is a very serious prophetic picture in this one verse. Throughout Scripture, water or waters speak of either peoples or the nations of the earth, 
restlessness, undercurrents, cross-currents, or eternal life, and the Holy Spirit flowing. Earth, or dust, is what man was created from in Genesis 2-7. It speaks of the flesh, or the works of the flesh. From this we can glean that on the third day there is going to be a separation of that which is of the flesh and that which is of the Spirit. Not only has the arm of flesh not ever accomplished and fulfilled the plans and purposes of God, but on this day it will be exposed for what it truly is, flesh. We will begin to see a clear demarcation between the works of the flesh and that which is truly of the Spirit. Today's headlines show restlessness in the world. The undercurrents, the cross-currents of change, give us a natural picture of the supernatural separation now underway. There will be a separation within the church itself as this third day advances, and there will be a separation in the world as the earth races toward destruction. Unity will come to the body of Christ as those who are led by the Spirit of God position themselves according to the voice of the Lord and surrender their agendas for the strategies of heaven. This will be the waters gathering together in one place, bringing forth a unity in the body of Christ that has eluded us for centuries. There is a separation and transformation of the individual believer as the Lord turns up the heat to cause us to reflect upon what is in our heart and to examine ourselves in the light of His glory. The dross always comes to the surface when the furnace is alight. Sowers and Reapers Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. Amos 9.13 The Lord says that the days are at hand, and we will see the fulfillment of every vision according to Ezekiel 12. No longer will his word be postponed, but there will be a complete fulfillment of every word of God to us and to this generation. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, what is this proverb that you people have about the land of Israel, which says, The days are prolonged, and every vision fails? Tell them, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will lay this proverb to rest, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. But say to them, the days are at hand, and the fulfillment of every vision. For no more shall there be any false vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord. I speak, and the word which I speak will come to pass. It will no more be postponed. For in your days, O rebellious house, I will say the word and perform it, says the Lord God. Ezekiel 12, 21 to 25. The seeds that we have to sow are the same seeds that God sowed when He spoke, and it came to pass. You and I are created in God's image and in His likeness, after His kind. He breathed into us the very breath of life, the Ruach HaKodesh, or Holy Spirit. Therefore we have that impartation of the very Spirit of God. When we speak, creative power goes forth out of our mouths. Understand, the reaper overtakes the sower in the last hour, and the seed that we sow grows quickly. Why? Because it is the seventh day, the conclusion of the plan of the living God. He is doing a quick work in the earth as we race toward the fulfillment of His Word. Watch the words of your mouth. Since late 1998 into 1999, I've observed that the prophetic word often manifests fulfillment within days or even hours of being spoken. For example, in a meeting I held in Coeur Idaho, I gave a woman a prophetic word, 
and within minutes she came back and shared with me how the Lord had just fulfilled that word via a phone call she had just received. You see, the reaper is overtaking the sower. We won't be able to sow the seed fast enough to keep ahead of the reaper, therefore we must be very aware of what we speak. The sower sows the word. Mark 4:14. 4, we need to get this scripture into our hearts. You are a sower, and you sow the word. Not just God's holy word, the Bible, but every word that comes out of your mouth is a seed that is sown with creative power in it. You might say, wait a minute, I sow more than just words. I sow finances, time, energy, gifting, etc. That is true. However, your harvest is dependent upon your corresponding words. They are not only seed that is sown, but they also water the seed that has been sown. You are snared by the words of your own mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. Proverbs 6, 2. This information is not new, but the principle is fresh due to the day and hour in which we live. There is an added dimension, an added significance to the seed we sow in this the last day. What we sow, we will reap. Life or death, blessing or cursing, we will be snared by the words of our mouth. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 14, 12 to 14. Many of us have quoted this scripture. We hope it causes the Lord to anoint us with power to accomplish signs, wonders, and miracles so that we will ultimately be seen of men and make room for our ministry. What we fail to realize is that the first works that Jesus did had nothing to do with signs, wonders, or miracles. He learned obedience through the things he suffered. See Hebrews 5, 8. He became of no reputation and took the form of a bond servant. See Philippians 2, 7. He suffered temptation, see Hebrews 2, 18. He was reviled and did not revile in return, see 1 Peter 2, 21-23. These are the works that shaped Jesus' character to such an extent that the Father could entrust to him all the authority of heaven and release to him the Spirit without measure. Jesus said that we would do the works that he did also. He laid down his life that others might live. In what way are we emulating him in his first works? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Galatians 6, 7-9 There are some very poignant questions we must ask ourselves at this time. What type of seed do we sow? What type of harvest will overtake us in this hour? What do we sow into the lives of those around us? Do not be deceived, we will give an account for the words of our mouth. In this third day, the Lord has been training and retraining His people to be very aware of what they speak, what they look upon, what they listen to, what they surround themselves with, where they go, etc. The responsibility required of us is greater today than previously. The seeds we sow today will reap a quick harvest now and in the future as well. The following is a personal testimony of sowing the correct seed. In February 2001, 
the Lord began to speak to me that I was crowned with the unparalleled, unprecedented, unmerited favor of God. Each morning, I would confess what the Lord had revealed to me, that I was crowned with unparalleled, unprecedented, unmerited favor. I printed signs and framed them and put them up in my home to remind me of what the Lord was saying to me. I began to teach this message in various places as the Lord would lead. During that year, I was given a house, a Corvette, a motor home, and I was asked if I wanted a sailboat. The house needed remodeling, and I was given all the funds necessary to make the renovations. Was I special? No, it was my agreement with the Word and my actions that enforced my agreement. I sowed seed in accordance with that Word. My confession was in agreement with what was in my heart, and I reaped a tremendous harvest. The end of that story came in December 2001, while I was in Oklahoma City during Christmas and New Year's. I began to seek the Lord and ask Him what He had in store for 2002. The Spirit of God spoke to me and said that 2002 was a year of increase. I was astonished and dumbfounded. I couldn't conceive of anything else He might want to give me. An airplane? A cruise ship? I just couldn't imagine what He was trying to tell me. So I asked him what he wanted me to do to prepare for this increase. He said that I was to give everything away, all the blessings he had bestowed upon me that past year, the house, the car, the motor home, everything. So I did, and the increase was greater than I could have expected or imagined. He gave me my precious wife, Reshma, and the increase has not stopped since and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Revelation 12, 11. Notice there are three key points in this verse. You overcome first and foremost by the blood of the Lamb. In this day and hour, there will be tremendous revelation released regarding the blood of Jesus and the power of that blood. Many have forgotten that knowledge. The old-timers during Pentecost understood the power of the blood. The Spirit of God told them to use the blood to its fullest, and the blood would protect and fulfill them. There is nothing that can cross the bloodline if you apply it. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. In any situation you face, you overcome by the blood of the Lamb and everything it purchased for you. Second, you overcome by the word of your testimony. What is the word of your testimony today about any area of your life? Do the words of your testimony line up with the words of Jesus' testimony? Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea! For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Revelation 12, 12. The devil is enraged. His time is short. We need to understand and appropriate the covenant power in the blood of the Lamb, and our testimony must reflect our faith in that shed blood. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. What is your testimony today? Third, they loved not their lives even to death. This is called the crucified life. I've heard it said that we are loose change in God's pocket and He can spend us anywhere He wishes. While this may seem trite, I believe it is time for the body of Christ to develop a mindset of servanthood. Jesus became of no reputation and took the form of a bondservant. Too often in the church we vie for preeminence rather than esteeming others better than ourselves. Jesus himself became obedient, even unto death. How can we offer him anything less? It is the image of Christ in us that we must emulate. 
God's work in this third day is quick and amazing. The seeds we sow will not take years for us to reap a harvest, but we will be harvesting for years what we sow today. We must understand who we are, what we are called to be, and sow accordingly. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Psalms 107, 2. If you and I are redeemed, we need to speak it. We are delivered and redeemed from the hand of all our enemies. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10:10. 10, 10. Whatever you believe with your heart, you will confess with your mouth, because out of abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Matthew 12:34. It has become glaringly obvious that the majority of the church believes anything but the word of God. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Luke 6:45. What do we need salvation from today? What do we need the power of God to save us from today? Our salvation is in direction proportion to our confession, and our confession flows from what is deposited in our heart. Why is it that those who have walked the most with the Lord and have come to a place of maturity are the ones who speak the least? Because they understand that they are sowing and there will be a harvest. They understand the wisdom of refraining from trivial or idle conversation that has no life in it. Remember James 1, 19 and Proverbs 17, 27 to 28. Be slow to speak, slow to anger, and quick to listen. I phrase it like this. Only speak when spoken through. Only do what he tells you to do. Only go where he tells you to go and he will let you know what you need to know. With your mouth, sow only that which God tells you. Remember the swiftness of the harvest in this hour. Think about your words, and know that the blessings, the promises of God in your life are on the verge of fulfillment. This is the season of the fulfillment of every promise. That which you have stood for in faith over the years can be accomplished at any moment. As we search deeper into the third day prophetic message, you will begin to get a glimpse of the awesome harvest and season of promise that has opened before us. In this hour, it would do well for us to meditate upon and to understand the following scriptures. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. 1 John 5, 4 The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way, and the perverse mouth I hate. Proverbs eight thirteen. The mouth of the righteous is a well of life, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Proverbs ten eleven. The hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge the righteous will be delivered. Proverbs 11, 9. The words of the wicked are, lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright will deliver them. Proverbs 12, 6. A man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of a man's hands will be rendered to him. Proverbs 12, 14. A man shall eat well by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the unfaithful feeds on violence. He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Proverbs 13, 2-3. A man has joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. Proverbs 15, 23. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and adds learning to his lips. Proverbs 16, 23. 
A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. Proverbs 18.7 A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth, from the produce of his lips he shall be filled. Proverbs 18.20 Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Proverbs 18.21 Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. Proverbs 21-23 Quick Harvest It was 1998 and my first trip to Fiji. On the first Sunday morning, as I walked up a hill to the church, I heard the word earthquake in my spirit. At first I thought it was my imagination, but that still small voice persisted. Three times I heard earthquake. When I got to the pulpit for my first meeting, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, Prophecy earthquake. He continued, As a sign to you that Fiji is going to see revival, there will be an earthquake in the natural. It is a sign that I, the Lord, am going to shake up the established order in this country, first in the church and then in the natural. That was Sunday morning. Sunday evening, the Lord again quickened my spirit to prophecy, and he said, There is going to be a tropical storm that will cause widespread flooding, and it is a sign to you of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon Fiji. People will come to Fiji, not for the sun, surf, and sand, but because of the move of God on this nation. I had no idea that Fiji had been in nine months of drought at that time. Tuesday evening there was an earthquake. Two and a half days after the Lord spoke to me, a small tsunami hit the coral coast as a result of the earthquake, a prophetic picture of the nations coming to the shores of Fiji. On Thursday evening it began to rain, and I was told later that it was a very unusual storm because it rained heavily on all of the islands of the archipelago rather than the usual handful. Shortly after I left the country, the churches were in much upheaval as the Lord began to reveal and expose sin. Pastors were removed from ministry, and churches split as God revealed the motives of the hearts of His people. Two years later, in the year 2000, the president and parliament of Fiji was overthrown in a coup. By 2002, Fiji was in revival from one island to another. That's how quickly the prophetic word came to pass. This is when the Lord began to teach me about the third day quick harvest and the release of his anointing on this generation. Here is the key. When you speak when spoken through, God moves mightily to perform His word without the delay we once experienced, and the result is life. Conversely, when we speak according to our fleshly desires, or from the pressure of our circumstance, or when we react because of the situation we find ourselves in, the result can be death. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Confession leads to salvation. What we speak bears fruit, and the reaper overtakes the sower. This is the third day.